All right, we are now back for episode number 10 of The Invisible Enemy, going through the early days of COVID-19 here. And we're going to continue right on with rebuilding America, rebuilding this great nation to what it once was, right? Which is always a great thing. So let me open this up. Do, do, do. Okay, here we go. Put this in focus mode. Da, 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 da. This stuff, I don't know if that'll make a difference or not. Okay, so here we go. Rebuilding the country. Even as we prepare to rebuild our economy, President Trump stated during the April 17, 2020 press briefing. America continues to wage an all-out medical war to defeat the invisible enemy. To date, we have conducted more than 3.78 million coronavirus tests, by far the most of any country. It's not even close. In the hardest hit areas, such as New York and Louisiana, we've also tested more people per capita than South Korea, Singapore, and every other country. It's up to 1 million additional tests per week, President Trump continued. In the next few weeks, we'll be sending out 5.5 million testing swabs to the states. Swabs can be done easily by the governors themselves. Mostly it's cotton. It's not a big deal. You can get cotton easily. But if they can't get it, we will take care of it. And that's from President Trump's briefing from April 17, 2020. And those... Uh, tests. I remember seeing some of the photos and videos of what they did, and they looked pretty brutal, pretty brutal as far as what uh, the test consisted of. Sounded pretty brutal, but uh, nothing I would do. I'll take my chances. Okay, so let's move on. Um, as of April 18, 2020, the total number of reported COVID-19 cases reached 2,321,401 worldwide. Now, of those, the total number of active cases stood at 1,567,242, with 1,512,073, 96%. People in mild condition and 55,169.4% in serious or critical condition. So now I'm giving you some of the percentages. Um, there was a reported number of 754,159 closed cases. Of those closed cases, there were 594,538 79% recoveries and discharges, and 159,621 reported deaths. So that's how many deaths there were worldwide as of this, as of uh, April 18th, 2020, based on the numbers that they were getting as of April 18th. In the United States, the number of reported cases stood at 736,052, with um, 629,790 still active. So Reported cases, lots of active cases, and 106,262 closed cases. Um, 67,418 people had recovered or were discharged from hospitals, and 38,844 lost their lives to the coronavirus. So we had almost 40,000 deaths um, associated, related to, or credited by the coronavirus as of uh, April 18, 2020, based on the numbers they had as of April 18, 2020. We continue to see a number of positive signs that the virus has passed its peak, President Trump stated during his April 18, 2020 press briefing. It's been very devastating all over the world, 184,000 countries, probably more. That number was of a week ago. Since we released the guidelines to open up America again, President Trump continued, and this was two days ago, a number of states, a number of states led by both Democrat and Republican governors have announced concrete steps to begin a safe, gradual, and phased opening. Texas and Vermont will allow certain businesses to open on Monday while still, requ while still requiring appropriate social distancing precautions. And I can tell you the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, he knows what he's doing. 
He's a great governor. He knows exactly what he's doing. Montana will be lifting restrictions on Friday. Ohio, North Dakota, and Idaho have advised non-essential businesses to prepare for a phased opening starting May 1st. Now, regarding the number of deaths related to COVID-19, President Trump stated, we're not number one. China is number one, just so you understand. China is number one by a lot. It's not even close. They're way ahead of us in terms of death. It's not even close. You know it, I know it, and they know it. And you don't want to report it. Why? You'll have to explain that. Someday I'll explain it. So he's talking about those numbers, the skewed numbers where you know there's like minimal, very minimal deaths, very minimal cases in China. Even the numbers we talked about in the last show seem pretty low. I would say they seemed uh, very low. So Asked if China was cooperating with the United States and finding out why this all began, President Trump stated China was doing their own investigation, and so was the United States. Let's see what happens with their investigation, President Trump stated. But we're doing investigations also. Another reporter asked President Trump about potential consequences if Russia was, if I'm sorry, another reporter asked President Trump about potential consequences if China was responsible. Well, President Trump responded, if they were knowingly responsible, certainly. If it was a mistake, a mistake is a mistake. But if they were knowingly responsible, yeah, there should be consequences. We're going to stop right there just for one second here. I think we would all agree that obviously if a mistake was made, then a mistake was made, right? No big deal. But if... Um, it was not a mistake. That is a big deal. Now, obviously, we're not going to hear much about the uh, origins of this virus, where it all started at this point, right? We're not really hearing a whole lot about that. It's more about what we're supposed to do, the consequences of it, and what um, what the government wants the people to do. But we're not hearing a lot about where this got started, why this happened, um, and which I think is the main reason to really understand what the virus is. You have to understand where it all started, right? So if we're not even focusing on that, you're not hearing Biden talking about that. So it's interesting the questions that the media will ask President Trump as we go on, as we keep going on. You'll see exactly um, all, all the questions, the type of questions that they will ask President Trump and the type of questions that they will ask Biden whenever they, Biden takes a question, which is not very often. Um, but even his press secretary, whenever they ask her, look, look at the different questions and you can see a, a clear bias against Donald Trump. That's my view and uh, I'm sticking to that. All right, let's continue on here then. We have made it to page 115. We're now going to look at page 116. Okay, the contaminated tests. In a Washington Post article, David Willman reported on a contaminated testing kits produced by the CDC. Two of three CDC laboratories in Atlanta, Georgia, were most likely at fault for the contamination. That's the Washington Post article. Title of the article, Contamination at CDC Lab Delayed Rollout of Coronavirus Tests. So uh, again, just um, going to stop here. Just uh, I did, I was able to go back through a lot of the, um, the research articles that I had saved, and it looks like I did save a lot of these articles that we are reading here. So hopefully I'll be able to add those to my website, whatistruth911.wordpress.com. You'll be able to find those articles in case they get shoved down the memory hole. Um, they'll all be in PDF form, so you can go back and you can read those sources there. If retractions or anything were made after that, obviously it would not include that. But if retractions were made, then these links should still be active and we should be able to go to those websites and find that out. And the sources of all this was very important too, to make sure that we have all of the sources for everything that we are reading here. It is so Im important to have. Um, the main reason why I felt like this needed to be put in book form is because of the censorship of the shadow banning on all media platforms, basically, just about all. I haven't seen any on Rumble yet, so I can't really speak for that. Uh, not on Getter, Getter or on BitChute. So there may be others. I've heard Gab is good too. I have not tried out Gab yet. Um, Twitch, I'm not sure. I haven't, no, I've, I've updated my Twitch account, but I have not um, posted any content. I think you just can go live on Twitch. I think that's all you can really do. So 
we'll be looking at that, but we're always looking at alternative ways to get this media out. But obviously, as someone who loves to write, I love to read and I love to write. So um, as long as I can put this stuff down on paper and make it available for everybody, to me, that is a very big win. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm really looking forward to getting this book done and sharing this at trade shows and conventions, things like that. Conspiracy cons, once if they ever have them again, we'll see. It's uh, It was a very controlled environment anyways, but let's get back into sharing this and keep moving right on. I'll share my screen again. So that's the Washington Post article. Here's a little bit from it. So CDC made its tests in one of its laboratories rather than in its manufacturing facilities. FDA spokesman Stephanie Kokomo set told CNBC on April 18, 2020. CDC did not manufacture its tests consistent with its own protocol. At that time, Kokomo stated the FDA was still looking into whether the tests issued were due to a design or manufacturing issue. I haven't really heard too much about that after, but the tests themselves were contaminated way back then. Hopefully they've been doing a better job since then, right? So in an email to CNBC, CDC spokesman Benjamin Haynes stated something similar. The issue with the N3 component of CDC's diagnostic test for COVID-19 may be the result of a design and or manufacturing issue or possible contamination. And that is a CNBC article from 4-18-2020 titled Coronavirus Tests Delayed by COVID-19 Contamination at CDC Lab. Even though it wasn't at a lab, was that a manufacturing facility? <laughs> Or um, CDC made its test in one of its laboratories rather than a manufacturing facility. So there you go. So doing at a lab compared to a manufacturing facility. It's pretty interesting. Wouldn't have caught my attention, but it, this, these articles did because there was um, a lot of interesting stuff that was coming out about it, especially because I knew they were going to try to pin all of this on Donald Trump somehow. So even the mainstream articles were kind of um, posting a lot of things that were going to be critical of the testing, critical of the government's response to President Trump's response to all of this. So it's interesting to see how uh, the media responded to President Trump when all this happened and how they praised um, how they praised Joe Biden and everything that they're doing with the vaccines where people are getting the vaccines and still testing positive for COVID-19. Booster shots and all. The same day, the CDC released a statement about serological tests. Unlike a test designed to diagnose an active COVID-19 infection, specifically from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, serological tests can help identify individuals who have developed an immune response to the virus, either as part of an active infection or prior infection. The tests detect the presence of antibodies in the blood. If antibodies are present, that indicates that the person has been exposed to the virus and developed antibodies against it, which may mean that person has at least some immunity to the coronavirus. In the early days of an infection, when the body's immune response is still building, antibodies may not be detected, which is why serological tests should not be used as a sole basis to diagnose or exclude infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's a very powerful statement right there. And these serological tests should not be used as a sole basis to diagnose or exclude infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Hmm. There's still a great deal about COVID-19 immunity that we don't fully understand. For example, we don't yet know that just because someone has developed antibodies that they are fully protected from reinfection or how long any immunity lasts. And that's what we're seeing with, um, with the vaccine and all that. You know, how long does it last? That's why they keep saying, talking about booster shots, booster shots, because what they're giving us or what they're giving people who have decided to take it, to take the vaccine, <laughs> you got to keep taking these booster shots and what is in them. And is that good for your body? Is that good for your natural immunity? Um, which I believe we all do have at some point. Some of us may, you know, have stronger. Some of us may have lower, but I think we all generally 
generally have it at some degree. Um, maybe not all, but hopefully most of us do. Uh, let's continue on. We do expect that data from more widespread serological testing will help us track the spread of the virus nationwide and assess the impact of our public health efforts now, while also informing our COVID-19 response as we continue to move forward. Determining the next steps in our response to COVID-19 is partially dependent on an, an accurate assessment of our national efforts thus far, and the quality of data for making this decision is dependent on accurate testing products. That's from the FDA, their press announcements, uh, news events, press announcements, it's titled Coronavirus COVID-19 Update, Serological Test Validation and Education Efforts. So regarding testing for COVID-19, President Trump stated the process was getting better and better. I took the first test, Trump stated during the press briefing. The first test was not pleasant. This was not a pleasant thing. I said, you got to be kidding to the doctor. You got to be kidding. Up your nose and then we hang a right and it goes down here. And then we'll wiggle it around here under your eye. And then we'll pull it out and we'll say, I said, no, that's, there's no way that can happen. Is that the way it goes? You sure? This was a very unpleasant test, President Trump continued. And then I was tested a few weeks later with the new test that just came out, the Abbott, where they just touch your nose, basically, and they put it in a machine. And literally, a few minutes later, they tell you if you're fine. And I was lucky in both cases because I've seen the damage this, that this does to people. Yeah. And look at what he was saying there. Um, up your nose, then we hang a right, and it goes down here, and then we'll wiggle it around here under your eye. Oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. Who knows what type of damage that could cause? But we have great tests, President Trump continued. They've really gotten better and better and better as we go along. But we have a tremendous lab capability, laboratory capabilities all over the country. And for some reason, the governors, they're not. A lot of them are. But some of the governors like to complain, and they're not using it. We have tremendous capability. We're ready for them. And as we go along, just like with ventilators, we'll get better, more advanced. And, you know, it'll be, we'll be able to do things that nobody would have even believed possible. But we started off with a broken system. We inherited a broken, terrible system. Accurate. So that's at the bottom of page uh, 117. All right, frozen country. As of April 20th, 2020, there were more than two, 22 million people out of work in the United States. That number probably does not include those who have a reduced work schedule like me. Trump is still doing press briefings just about every day, and the tension is rising in the Bay Area. I might have even seen a drone today. In the USA, the number of reported cases reached 792,759, and 677,858 of those were still active. 72,389 people had recovered from COVID-19, but 42,514 people had not. Worldwide, that means 442,000 deaths. Worldwide, there were 2,481,287,000 reported cases of COVID-19 with 170,436 deaths and 646,854 recoveries. So those are the numbers as of April 20th. In light of the attack from the invisible enemy, President Trump tweeted on April 20th, 2020, as well as, can I fix that typo? Maybe. Yeah, as well as the need to protect the jobs of our great American citizens, I will be signing an, an executive order to temporarily suspend immigration into the United States. That's his tweet. When a governor acts, Attorney General William Barr said on April 21st during an interview on the Hugh Hewitt show, especially when a governor does something that intrudes upon or infringes on a fundamental right or a constitutional right, they're bounded by that. And those situations are emerging around the country to some extent. 
And I think we have to do a better job of making sure that the measures that are being adopted are properly targeted. They also can run into the federal role under the commercial clause, the so-called dormant com commerce clause. We do have a national economy, which is the responsibility of the federal government. So it is possible that governors will take measures that impair interstate commerce. And just where that line is drawn, you know, remains to be seen. During the interview, Hugh Hewitt asked about some of the local officials who were, quote, quick to use their authority to target specifically communities of faith in a way that distinguishes the rules set for them as opposed to other organizations. And I think that's one of those blunt instruments, Hugh Hewitt continues. Have you noticed that yourself? He asks uh, Attorney General William Barr. Should they be on notice that, and well, in my view, I don't know what your view is, that that violates the free exercise clause. We did more than put them on notice, answered Barr. We filed a statement of interest in a case in Mississippi where they were discriminating against religious practice and the putting restriction on religion that they were not putting on commercial activities that had all the same features. And we filed a statement of interest. And I understand that the government has pulled back from those restrictions, at least to some degree so far. And I issued a statement pointing out that whatever measures are placed against religion have to be placed against all comparable commercial and other activities. You can't single out religion for special burdens. But blunter instruments that say everyone has to shelter in place to stay at home regardless of the situation on the ground, or, you know, you shut down a business regardless of the capacity of the business to operate safely for its customers and its employees. Those are very blunt instruments. And I think, you know, as I say, I think we have to adapt more to the circumstances. The president's plan does that. You know, I also think that we have to, got, we have to give businesses more freedom to operate in a way that's reasonably safe. They know their business. They have the capacity to figure out, as the Marines say, improvise, adapt, and overcome how to conduct their business in a way that's safe. I think we have to give businesses that opportunity. The question really shouldn't be, you know, some government saying, well, this is essential or non-essential. The question is, can this business operate safely? So it's all about opening up the country here and uh, reopening everything. So that's from the HughHewitt.com and uh, the article Attorney General William Barr on the crisis. So good stuff there. Probably should have added a little more introductory about what they were talking about, but the frozen country where everything is being frozen out. And um, what they're talking about is the religious um, restrictions, restrictions on going to church, basically, when other businesses are not having the same restrictions or the same punishments. So... Uh, he's saying they can't be, can't have it like that. That's what William Barr is saying, basically. It has to be fair. And if they're going to restrict the uh, churches, then they have to restrict a lot of other things first. But that's the way I understood it. So Houston Police Officers Union. So here's something April 22nd. Uh, this is, uh, let's see. I guess I'll have to read this to understand this. It's been a while since I've looked at this. This is page 120. Houston Police Officers Union. To our community and our officers, it has come to our attention. The county judge, Linda Hidalgo, will issue an order this afternoon for all of Harris County, making it mandatory for anyone over the age of 10 to wear a mask in public. Now, we want to be very clear. The Houston Police Officers Union believes everyone should be wearing a mask in public in order to protect themselves from the virus. And we are encouraging all of our officers to wear a mask. However, we draw the line at the draconian measures Hidalgo has decided to engage in. Our officers work every single day to bridge the gap with our community and earn their trust. We will not stand idly by and allow Hidalgo to tear that bridge down with her horrific leadership and echo chamber decision making. Wow. The HBOU has made contact with the Attorney General's office seeking an opinion on the legality of imposing a criminal penalty slash fine for anyone not wearing a mask in public. 
While we wait for the opinion, we are, we are reminding and informing our officers that they have discretion, discretion, discretion in matters such as these. It is clear the so-called leader of Harris County lacks any critical thinking skills. But let me assure the public, our officers do. This is awesome. The last thing any of us need to do is kick our community while they are down. Houston police officers are already stretched entirely too thin during the COVID-19 pandemic. Violent crime is up this year. Murders up by 35%. Property crime is up. Burglaries by nearly 30%. And HPD, Houston police officers, are staffing testing centers across the city. We do not have time to be pawns in Hidalgo's game of attempting to control the actions of law-abiding, tax-paying individuals of our community especially since this idiotic order is possibly an unconstitutional one from the county judge. Let me assure the community, our officers will continue to serve the, on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, risking our lives and our health to protect you. We will continue to serve with honor and respect our community, despite Hidalgo's best efforts to erode that respect. Wow. So this judge, uh, the county, Judge Lena Hidalgo wants it, to make it mandatory for anyone over the age of 10 to wear a mask in public. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So um, that's great. Um, Joe, Joe Gamaldi of the HPLU FOP Lodge 110 president. So that's awesome. This is a great letter here by the Houston Police Officers Union. Um, yeah, call them and thank them. There's a number right there, 832-200. 3410. That's on April 22nd, 2020. Powerful, awesome. I love it. Um, so looking at what a county judge has done, then we're going to look a little bit more. Only got a few more minutes here at the Santa Rita jail st st statistics. So I think we will um, cover that one next time. Uh, let's see, do we have enough? Oh, you know what? No, let's finish with this one because uh, in our next episode, we're finally going to get to something that has been banned, Dr. Dan Erickson. Um, so, yeah, let's finish this one here. This is on page 121, Santa Rita Jail st Statistics. So this is um, in Alameda County, um, California, Bay Area, California, Santa Rita Jail. As reported on April 22nd, 18 inmates tested positive for COVID-19. Seven of those inmates had recovered and 15 of them were still in custody. Two staff members or contractors also tested positive for COVID-19. In total, the, updated, the update stated 93 tests completed with 54 negative, 33 positive, and six pending. And there is the actual um, press briefing right there for all of you watching this on YouTube or Rumble or wherever you're watching it, the video version. That is from the alamedacountysheriffs.org at backslash admin underscore covid19.php so there it is right there the full thing you can look at that at those numbers uh the number of new positive cases continued to decline nationwide president trump stated during the april 22nd press briefing this was awesome because he was giving a press briefing maybe even two every day and he's getting criticized for being too long too short there would be a lot of questions. You can imagine the media circus of what they were asking him, what they weren't asking him is pretty interesting too. And what they were asking him to pair, compared to what they were asking other people, uh, governors, congressmen, et cetera, et cetera. So let's read on here. The number of new positive cases continued to decline nationwide, President Trump stated during the April 22nd press briefing. Recent hotspots appear to be stabilizing. The hotspots are, in some cases, very interesting what's going on, and they're going down. They're going in the right direction. Cases in the Boston area are now declining. The Chicago, curves, uh, the Chicago curve appears to have flattened, which is terrific, and Detroit is past its peak. These trends demonstrate that our aggressive strategy to battle the virus is working, and that more states will soon be in a position to gradually and safely reopen and we can see how far back trump even as he's you know even as he closed things was saying we need to reopen we need to reopen that's very important um for people to understand for people that think trump wanted everything shut down closed down to remain closed down it's just simply not the case okay it's very exciting trump continues it was very exciting 
even today, watching and seeing what's happening. And people are getting ready for, for that. People are getting ready and they're all excited. Okay, next fall and winter, Dr. Robert Redfield added. Dr. Rob, that's an interesting guy, Dr. Robert Redfield. Look up that guy. Um, but he was at this press briefing too, at this uh, briefing that Trump was giving on April 22nd. Next fall, Dr. Robert Redfield added, we're going to have two viruses circulating. We're going to have to distinguish between which is flu and which is the coronavirus. Very important quote right there. As we're still dealing with that, anytime anybody gets sick, first thing, what do you think? It's COVID. Okay, Dr. Redfield continues here. I think the American public is going to heed the request to relook at their vaccine hesitancy. Oh, to vaccine with confidence for flu. And I'm confident that the public health infrastructure that we're putting together now across the country so that we can early case diagnose, isolate, and contact trace. As I say, block, tackle, block, and tackle. That system is going to be there and we're going to be able to contain the virus. So this guy is a very interesting character. If you ever want to look him up, Dr. Robert Redfield. Um, but he is, uh, <laughs> let me just stop this for a second. Uh, it's pretty funny stuff. So he's going to use this to uh, promote the vaccine to help you try to get you to try to understand why you should get the vaccine based on this. It's pretty interesting stuff there. Hmm. And when I say vaccine, obviously we mean flu vaccine because they're still working on the vaccine. They're doing a lot of a testing for COVID-19 at this point, but, you know, maybe some trial vaccines, some things like that. But um, the flu vaccine was still the big thing. But he does make a good point that we're going to need to distinguish. And we should be doing this every year, not just the 2020, right? Every year to to distinguish what is the difference between COVID-19 and the flu. It's pretty interesting when you think about it, the COVID-19 and the flu, uh, the symptoms are very similar. Um, I just really believe COVID-19 is, is a manufactured thing. It's not something that just kind of happened. It's not an accident. I do believe there is more to it. Doesn't mean that I'm right, doesn't make it right. And I'm open to being wrong, obviously, but... Um, so that's pretty interesting for what they what they say about the flu and how this just happens to be very similar to what the flu is. People recover. So the, a pandemic, I don't know if that is even a proper term to call this. Is it really a pandemic, COVID-19? It's a bio attack, a chemical attack. It seems more in line with something like that, but a coordinated, a coordinated attack. Look at what it did. Look at how it got us. Look at what it has done, not only to the greatest country ever, but to the whole world. And how we react is the main thing. Those who panic die first. So we cannot panic. We cannot fear. God is with us. And uh, in the end, that's what really matters. That's what mattered in the beginning. And that's what will always matter here. So this has been episode number 10. And I want to thank you all for joining me here. Um, and I look forward to coming back. We've made it more than halfway through. I think we only have maybe 40 or so pages more to go, and I guess the series will kind of die out after that, but um, so far, so good. And no strikes on any of these yet on YouTube, but even if we do, they'll be on Rumble. My YouTube channel, Greg Fernandez Jr., is now synced with Rumble, so anything you see on YouTube, on this YouTube channel here, you will see on the Rumble channel as well. So that's awesome. Uh, I wish I would have done that with my original channel, but that's okay. You know, uh, all that content is still out there. And one day we'll, we'll be able to get that all uploaded and get all of that data back. But for now, we will continue on knowing that Jesus Christ is in charge of everything. The invisible enemy, whatever you want to call it, COVID-19 can be labeled as the invisible enemy. So can, can the devil very similarities too it attacks only certain people and affects all of us but affects some of us more than others and kills some of us some of us it doesn't some of us we do recover from it so very similar when you think about COVID-19 and the devil the invisible enemies that we face every day continually devil does not sleep COVID-19 does not sleep either it gets everywhere we saw a couple episodes in the past it gets on people's shoes on their shoes we were told it would not transmit from human to human. 
And we know that that's not true either. So, all right, good peeps. God bless you all. And until next time, thank you all again for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope it has been helpful. And again, one day all this will be included in a book. I'm just three books behind right now. So um, just do the best you can, do what you can. And God bless you all. Keep the truth alive. Until next time.